thank you very much. Thank you very much for that very, very warm welcome. And I would like to uh, <clears throat> welcome the Atlas Foundation Board of Directors and and IHS people and other out-of-town guests uh, to the Washington area. And at the same time, I wish you every success in getting out of the Washington area safely. <laughs> <clears throat> and as a, as a lover of liberty, uh, I want to also thank you uh, for your continuing, continuing vision and the great work started by my departed friend, Sir Anthony uh, Fisher, it was his vision that led to the formation of free market think tanks uh, in Europe and South America and North America, and more recently, I'm very happy to say, uh, <clears throat> on the continent of Africa. And I think that it was his vision and others that if mankind is left to his own devices, he would settle down and be, naturally be a capitalist. And I think that the vision of the institutes and the great work um, of the institutes that uh, uh, Sir Fisher uh, set up uh, was, <coughs> was kind of seen in, some, in my getting these people as uh, as Alex talked about, uh, to help me talk to five million Americans on the Rush Limbaugh show, and I uh, and I tell you that the listeners were enthused uh, with the uh, uh, with the At Atlas Foundation uh, sponsored uh, institutes um, uh, scholars that I had. Now, when I said that mankind's natural tendency is to be a capitalist, I should have also said that this tendency includes a high standard of morality. And indeed, most of the problems that we encounter represent a breakdown in moral standards which are part and parcel of capitalism, free markets, laissez-faire, whatever name we might give to the process where property is privately held and mankind goes about his ordinary business engaging in peaceable voluntary exchange. Frederick Bastiat, which I'm quite sure most of you know about, uh, he's the French philosopher economist who wrote <coughs> an excellent little book uh, called The Law. And if you have not read the book, your instructions are to read the book tomorrow. And if you don't have the book, write me a letter and I will send you a copy of the book. Frederick Bastiat said, when law and morality contradict one another, the citizen has the cruel alternative of either losing his sense of morality or losing his respect for the law. We Americans are increasingly encountering Bastiat's cruel alternative. And let me spend just a few moments examining this phenomenon. Traditionally, the common law assumption was that if one behaved morally and used common sense, the reasonable person doctrine, some of his actions could possibly lead to civil penalties for accidents and mistakes, but not to criminal penalties. With the growth of the Leviathan state in our country, that has all changed. Under what lawyer James D. DeLong calls the new criminalization in our country, with its increased complexity and arbitrary provisions, no one, no American can rely on his moral compass or common sense 
to steer him clear of criminal prosecution. For example, let me give you a few examples. An engineer in Maryland was contracted to do work on private property. He was imprisoned for polluting the navigable waters of the United States by merely dumping two truckloads of soil on dry land. A rancher was criminally prosecuted for clearing brush from old irrigation ditches. Another man was brought, <coughs> brought to before a grand jury for stabbing a falcon, falcon, whatever you want to call him, with a pitchfork that was killing one of his chickens. Another man was charged for shooting a bear in self-defense. In Newark, New Jersey, 500 people have been fined for putting aluminum cans in their trash. These and possibly thousands of other examples damage the societal sense of morality. That is, people who see themselves as responsible, law-abiding people begin to develop a contempt for the law. And when we lump what's trivial with what's barbaric as criminal activities, as we are increasingly doing in our country, it undermines our sense of moral priorities. As in the case of Newark, where 500 people have been fined for deliberately or inadvertently putting beer cans in their trash, that kind of says to people, well, it's more important to prosecute people for these kinds of activities than to prosecute all the thieves, murderers, and rapists in Newark, New Jersey. The growth of the Leviathan State is undermining our moral priorities, I believe. Deficits and debt are another example of our declining morality in our country. Now, we all know that we have federal deficits exceeding $300 billion a year. I know at the Clinton administration, they give another number, but if you uh, take away all the games, you're talking about $300 billion or more a year. And we have a national debt that's approaching $5 trillion. And matter of fact, that uh, $5 trillion national debt is understated because if we include all federal obligations, such as Social Security, government retirement, guaranteed loans, et cetera, et cetera, we'd be talking about something closer to $16 trillion. Now, this is something unprecedented in our history. For the most part, the only time in our history when we ran deficits was during war times. In 1787, federal spending was about $3 million a year, or about $1 per citizen. By 1910, the federal government spent a little more than $600 million a year, about $6.75 per person. By 1929, the federal government spent $3 billion a year, and they, they went up to $29 per person. Today, the federal government spends over $4 billion per day, and that comes to $6,000 per person, and controlling for inflation, that represents a 9,000% increase in federal spending between 1929 and today. Now, the, our founding fathers, who were paying about 67 cents a year in taxes, they went to war with Great Britain, <laughs> claiming that taxation without representation is tyranny. 
Now that reminds me of a conversation I was having in Cambridge, uh, London, with uh, Lord Harris of High Cross and Peter Bauer and several other people. And uh, Lord Harris of High Cross, he asked me, uh, Williams, he said, where do you live? And you know, I tend to be flippant sometimes. <laughs> and so I said, I live in Valley Forge, Pennsylvania. That's where the British ran George Washington, but we came out when the winter was over and kicked your butts out of the country. <laughs> And so he said, yeah, you went to war with us for taxation without representation. He said, how do you feel about it with representation? <laughs> so, uh, so I owe Lord Harris of High Cross a gotcha. <laughs> now, our profligate spending is an example of moral, is another example of moral decline because we've lost fiscal discipline and regard for future generations. After all, we might ask, what is the moral basis for imposing massive obligations on future generations in the name of bread and circuses? But the tragedy of it all is that there's little indication or incentive to reverse that trend. In 33 years, we've had one balanced budget in our country, but Congress tries. Going back to 1974, we remember that Congress passed the Budget Control Act. You might ask, is the budget in control? In 1979, Congress passed the Balanced Budget Act, making balanced budgets the law of the land. Now, of course, remember the 1984 tax increases that were widely publicized as, and sold to Americans as a down payment on the deficit. In 1985, we had the Graham Rudman Hollings Emergency Deficit Reduction Act, which mandated a balanced budget by the end of 1992. Then we had the 1990 budget deal that was supposed to bring, cut the budget, the uh, deficit in half. And of course, uh, last year we had the budget deal, which was the largest tax increase in our history, and again, sold to Americans as a, uh, as a deficit fighter. Now, there's, I think one of the things we have to recognize is that there's little private incentive among all of us to downsize government spending. And this can be seen when we consider when we ask ourselves the question, what are the prospects of a person winning political office, either as a representative or as a senator or as a president, who campaigned to strictly uphold the United States Constitution, both its letter and spirit, and refuse to call for or participate in activities whereby the government confiscates what right, rightfully belongs to one American and give it to another American to whom it does not belong. Such a person campaigning on that kind of promise would never win office. That is, if I'm campaigning, if I'm running for the senator from Virginia, and I say, uh, I will not uh, support, I will not bring back Virginians uh, meals on wheels, aid to higher education, highway construction funds, I would never win office. And if such a candidate were actually elected, he would have neither respect nor credibility, and his constituents would probably run him out of office. And the tragedy of all this, the supreme tragedy of all this, is that his constituents would be absolutely right from an economic point of view. That is, and the reason is very simple, that is, if a senator does not bring home goodies for his constituents, it doesn't mean that his constituents' taxes will be lowered. All that it means is that instead of Virginia citizens getting the goodies, Iowa citizens get the goodies. In other words, he'd be asking his constituents to commit Harry Carey. And I don't believe that that's a very successful political argument. We have in our country what some scholars 
called the tragedy of the commons, whereby it pays for everybody to use government in attempt to steal from everybody else in our country. It kind of reminds me when I was in the Army that um, this is in basic training in 1959 in Fort Jackson, South Carolina. I had a lot of other problems because uh, I was sent down to Fort Jackson without a good orientation on the southern way of life and so I had some adjustment problems. But um, anyway, we had a full field inspection. And I showed up at the inspection without my mess kit. And the sergeant standing about an inch and a half away from my face, shouting in my face, asking me where my uh, mess kit was. And I told him it was stolen. He said, that's no damn reason for showing up at a full field uh, inspection without your mess kit. He says, if somebody steals yours, steal somebody else's. <laughs> now, that might be a great way to run an army, <laughs> but it's not the best way to run a country. That is, we, it pays for us to become a nation of thieves, given the status quo or the tragedy of the commons. Now, other problems arise as government grows. We know that government has been growing, and we know that it encounters fiscal problems. Congress cannot spend as easily as it used to. It still is able to spend. But the fiscal problems, they limit the politicians' ability to transfer cash to their favorite constituents. So they seek other ways that result in Americans encountering more of Bastiat's cruel alternative. And we become criminals for engaging in activities previously deemed as moral and lawful. For example, Congress has a reduced ability to give cash handouts to farmers. So what's an alternative? Well, Congress can mandate a share of the gasoline market for ethanol producers. And that forces consumers to give farmers money that they otherwise would not get. Now, now here's uh, how you criminalize uh, human behavior. A gasoline producer who refuses to use ethanol becomes a criminal whereby before he was not a criminal. We have criminalized another activity. If the, Clinton and, if the Clinton administration and Congress managed to socialize our health care, what is moral and lawful right now, namely paying a doctor out of our own pockets, will be a criminal activity. Lovers of kangaroo rats, you know, a lot of people out there love kangaroo rats. They could go to Congress for an appropriation to purchase land for these creatures to live. But that would be a visible cost. And with budget squeezes, vis uh, uh, such a visible cost might not be politically viable. So Congress can hide the transfer through the Endangered Species Act, mandating that private landowners set aside a portion of their land for the kangaroo rat. Enforcing rules like these that have no moral foundation and have the most trivial of benefits with increasing punitive measures undermines respect for and the perceived legitimacy of government. And as that happens, Government attempts to coerce respect that it cannot earn. And because there are enforcement costs and the lack of resources, government has to exact draconian penalties for minor offenses in order to set examples as a means to get general compliance. Now, the only hope that I have Things look pretty dismal. And matter of fact, if you are a, I, I think one, one has recognized that the that normal state of human affairs 
is for a person to be subject to arbitrary control and abuse by others. That's the normal state of human affairs, both uh, historically and currently right now. And liberty, the kind of liberty that you and I have known in our country, is relatively rare in human history. It's not the normal state of affairs. I'm very sure that if a historian writing 300 years from now, he may very well say, well, look, they, we had this little uh, historical curiosity called liberty, uh, mostly in the Western world for a few years, but everything went back to the way that it uh, uh, always uh, was. So I'm not, that, I'm not all that optimistic about liberty, but the only hope that I have for the amputation of the heavy hand of government in our country is the Tenth Amendment movement, movement uh, the embryotic Tenth Amendment movement going on in many parts of our country. You know, I've been writing a nationally syndicated column for about 14 years, and last October, I wrote a column that brought in the most favorable and supportive mail that I've ever received. And the column started out with a sentence that I thought that, I said in the column that, I think that we reached the point in our country where liberty-minded Americans need to start thinking about secession. And I was telling, and I was saying in the column, I was saying in the column that I'm not an expert on secession, but I was proposing that we keep the, the liberty-minded Americans keep the 13 original uh, states plus Texas and give the rest to the socialists with an option to buy it. Uh, but anyway, after having written that column, I got quite a few letters about movements that I had not heard of uh, previously. Uh, Several were secessionist movements, I think the largest of which is in Louisiana, uh, the, uh, the, the peaceful secession, uh, secession movement. One was the ultimatum resolution that's uh, headed by, I believe, uh, governor, um, ex-governor Bracken or something like that in uh, Utah. And the ultimatum resolution, uh, these people in Utah are trying to get 38 state legislatures to call for the dissolution of the federal government when the national debt gets the six uh, trillion dollars. That was the trigger point. But there's the, there's a the 10th amendment movement that's very interesting. And it's a movement going mostly in the west, going on mostly in the western part of the United States, which suggests, by the way, that if you look at the states that are actually involved with this movement, they're mostly in the west, we might be able just to divide the country, use the Mississippi River and divide the country up. Uh, called West United States and East United States, um, if you went to secession route. But anyway, uh, legislatures in Hawaii, Colorado, and Missouri have already passed resolutions demanding that the federal government obey both the letter and the spirit of the Tenth Amendment and cease and desist from federal mandates. Fourteen other states have a similar document in the introduction or draft stage. Now, Colorado, very interestingly, it has put a bit of teeth in its version of the Tenth Amendment movement. That is, Colorado uh, has passed Senate Bill 157, for any of you interested in reading it, uh, requiring that state agencies, when making budget requests to comply with a federally mandated or authorized program, they must show to the satisfaction of three bodies in Colorado that the program is both authorized under the federal constitution and the state constitution. Now Colorado is going another step, which I think will prove to be very interesting, and that is they're working on a measure now whereby in the event that the federal government retaliates, let's say, they say to Colorado, well, you're not removing, we told you to get rid of asbestos in schools and you're not removing it, and therefore we're gonna cut off your highway construction funds. Well, what Colorado is doing, it's in the currently in process of writing a bill, whereby they will withhold taxes that they collect and remit to the federal government. 
to the extent of the amount that the federal government has cut the highway funds. Uh, for example, they just won't remit their, uh, the federal uh, gasoline tax uh, to the uh, uh, federal government. I think that all of us need to support uh, these movements because if, we, if the federal government is forced to obey the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution, well then some of the other issues fall by the wayside, such as some of the, the takings under the, uh, in violation of the Fifth Amendment or, or the, the Brady Bill or other kinds of things, uh, uh, other kinds of measures by the federal government, uh, they would fall aside if we can get the federal government to obey the Tenth Amendment to the Constitution. Let me just close by saying uh, that the strongest weapon that we have against government encroach encroachment on our liberties is in the arena of ideas. And on that note, I wish the Atlas Foundation and the Institute for Humane Studies and, and related think tanks uh, and their prodigy uh, continued success. Uh, we need all the help that we can get as we do battle with the Hun. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.